Deserving listeners, I thought I would answer patron emails. This email is from upper tier patron Lex from Olympia. They write, My name is Lex, and I'm currently an undergrad student about to graduate. I've felt a strong calling into becoming a therapist or any role where I can become a resource for people who want to work on their healing. This is mainly from my own experiences of trauma and healing. Sometimes, though, I feel like I might not be up for the job because my emotions tend to get very affected by the many injustices I see in people's lives, especially as I see them related to my own. I also worry about being overwhelmed about the things going on in my own life that it would affect my ability to fully serve the clients and communities in the ways that they need to be served. I was wondering if you had any tips for building resilience around burnout or compassion fatigue or navigating counter-transference. End of email. Yeah, I get a lot of emails like this, and I've answered emails like this on the podcast before, but I think it bears repeating because I think that there's a lot of people out there who would relate to you, uh, Lex. So you say that you get upset about the many injustices that you see. Well, that is not a weakness. That is a strength. Clients need us to get upset about injustice. I have had multiple clients say to me that it was very helpful for them to see me get upset, get angry, get personally angry about the injustices that they experience. You people who listen to this podcast, you probably uh, occasionally hear me rant and rave about injustice. I'm guessing that it is either in line with how you're thinking or changes your mind in some ways or something, but it, it probably is welcomed, right? I welcome when people rant and rave about injustice because that's the only way we're going to get things to change. And it just feels good to vent about injustice. When my wife gets, uh, you know, someone flips her off on the freeway and is yelling at her about some stupid uh, road rage situation, and she comes home and she experienced an injustice on the highway, Well, she wants to rant and rave about that, and I want to listen to that. So for you, Lex, if you get affected by the many injustices, that's good. That means you're open. That means you're smart. It means you're wise. It means you're attuned to the world. And with your clients, they're going to really appreciate that. You also worry about being overwhelmed with your own issues. This isn't likely. I have heard many people say this. Well, I feel like if I become a therapist, it would be overwhelming, my own issues and the client's issues. I mean, how do you deal with that? Well, it's not like you just get thrown into the profession. You are taught many different things. You are supported in a lot of ways. You have supervisors. You have a direct supervisor, if not multiple direct supervisors, for several years before you can practice without supervision. And those supervisory relationships are very important and can really help you. This is a senior person who's been through it. They've been there, done that, and they can help you. Also, there are mentors that you can actually build relationships with professors and other people who can be there for you when you need to talk to them. So so it's possible that you can be overwhelmed with your own issues when you're talking to clients, but it's not likely. All therapists have issues, and frankly, all people have issues. The more and more I think about it, I can't think of a single person in my life who doesn't have significant relational traumas that affect them on a daily basis. Everyone has it. Now, some people have it to a greater degree, I, but I have it. Everyone has it. It's just a thing. But Lex, you go to therapy for maybe the rest of your life because that's what you do when you have issues. And that's just what you do when you're trying to be the best therapist you can be is you go to therapy. You, again, have supervision. You consult with colleagues. You self-reflect. There's a lot of different things. There's a whole system of how to deal with this. You also talk about resilience. How can you be resilient to burnout and compassion fatigue? Well, you'll kind of figure that out as you go. A, a central feature to the method of, of resisting burnout is, and compassion fatigue, which are overlapping issues, is to take your time with your career. Some people will dive in and see 40 clients a week and wonder why they hate their job. Well, that's just too much. So it's a matter of balance and figuring that out for you. 
how to take vacations, how to not take your work home with you. And often what that means is you have to, if you work at an agency, you have to push back. Because an agency is like a, a mental health agency, which is usually pe where people start off in their careers. These agencies are businesses. They're like Microsoft or a restaurant or, um, you know, uh, <laughs> what's the, Monsant Monsanto? Monsanto, is that how you say they, they are trying to make money and keep the business afloat. And those pressures of money and capitalism means that labor will be exploited as best as they can do. And in the same way that Boeing will try to exploit labor as best as they can, and the union has to push back and say, no, you can't work us to the bone. You have to have safety measures. We have to have a certain amount of vacation. We have to have health care. You can't treat us badly or else we as a labor force are going to strike. So, but therapists at agencies typically are not unionized. And I think that there's this idea that mental health agencies are somehow like these 100% altruistic creatures. Believe me, they are not. Now, certainly they're, they're filled with altruistic, compassionate people, but they're often run and administered by business people, or at least people who are thinking mainly about business and not about uh, human issues, if you will. And so a part of working at a mental health agency is being your own union because if you're not a part of a union then you have to be your own union you have to be your own advocate you have to you have to push back it's the job of labor to push back on management and say no this is where i draw the line and it, because if you don't do that then it, you know management's just going to walk all over you they're going to work you to the bone and you're going to feel ashamed of yourself they're going to make you feel ashamed of yourself there's a lot of people that work for Microsoft and Amazon in Seattle, and I've had many clients who work for Amazon and Microsoft over the years, particularly Microsoft since I've been in practice for 25 years in Seattle, 24 years. And they will talk about how Microsoft, you know, it's a large organization. There's a lot of different cultural pockets within the organization. But in general, it tends to try to work people to the bone work all night long, all weekend long. And there's this culture about always trying to strive in competition with your fellow colleagues because you want to get these good reviews at the end of the year so that you can be promoted. And if you, st or you can even be demoted if you aren't rated very well by your colleagues in comparison to your colleagues. And so it creates this culture of privileging the person who works 24 seven. And that is just not okay. It's, it's it's just it's not okay in the injustice realm, but it's also not okay for one's resilience and one's burnout. So, as a therapist, you have to push back and um, band together and that kind of thing. So that that's another part of it. Anyway, but you're talking about general resilience. Other things to do is trauma recovery. I'm guessing you've been through traumas yourself, Lex. Recovering from those traumas will help you to be more resilient to burnout. Uh, therapy in general, supervision, using supervision really well, finding a supervisor who you really connect with, looking for support, and having a method of self-awareness regarding countertransference and a method of processing your countertransference. You ask a very specific question, you know, how do any tips for building resilience and navigating tr countertransference? Navigating countertransference is a very complicated thing. And I've, ma I've made a number of episodes on it. You can go to our website and listen to older episodes on countertransference. Um, I guess you would go to the For Therapist tab and look for those episodes. And that's a complicated thing. But in general, a, it requires a uh, set of skills that you have to develop. And people have different levels of this skill. In my program at Antioch University, Couple and Family Therapy, we train people to do that. We uh, spend a lot of time. We don't just teach a lecture about countertransference. We actually walk them through the steps and have them demonstrate to us that they can do it. And it, I've seen some people take to it really quickly, and some people it takes a long time for them to learn how to connect with who they are, take responsibility for their behaviors, be differentiated, not be ashamed of their feelings, be okay with sharing their feelings with a supervisor that they trust or an instructor that they trust, and an ability to regulate one's emotions. 
it's very hard when you're in a session working with a client and the client is difficult or the client has traumas or you don't like the client for one reason or another. It's very difficult because you're, you're at work, you're trying to do your job and it's very complex. It, it's very difficult in that moment to self-reflect for like half a second in between words or in between sentences while still listening to them, while still intervening. But that's a skill you build over time. After 24 years myself, I, I know that I'm much better now at noticing my countertransference in the moment than I was 24 years ago. Now, because it's just practice makes perfect. The, the longer you do something, the easier it is to do, the faster it is that you do it. Think about for yourself, the first time you tried to drive a car, you thought about everything, right? You're like, okay, hands, 10 and two, okay, put it in park and what do I do here? Okay, make sure you signal. And now, after how many years of driving you've done, it's just automatic. It's just, you don't even have to think about it. It just, it just automatically happens. The, the car, you just drive the car to wherever you're going. Occasionally you have to think about something, but it's just, it becomes automatic. It's just an extension of your, of your body. Well, that's what you want to get to with countertransference. But that is through good education, good supervision, good at post-graduation supervision, good post-graduation practices, continuing to listen to podcasts about psychology that talk about these sorts of things, that sort of thing. So there's not really a tip in there. You know, there, there's, no, there's no tip I can say other than to continue to strive for the quickest amount of countertransference. If there's one tip, I suppose, is getting to know your physical responses and what that means getting to know what fear feels like in your chest, what happiness feels like in your f chest and face, what uh, jealousy or envy feels like in your spine or something. Getting to know the physical sensations because in therapy, the faster you notice those things and know what they mean, the better it is for you as a therapist to navigate it. Anyway, I hope that answers your email. So the, 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 in summary, Lex from Olympia uh, near Seattle is uh, if, if you feel the calling and, you, you, want, and you, you want to dedicate yourself to this, there's nothing I'm hearing in your email that would prevent you from being a wonderful therapist. In fact, a lot of things you're saying would make you extremely uh, strong as a therapist, noticing injustices, being concerned about burnout. Uh, really concerned about your clients and making sure you don't harm your clients. These are wonderful qualities in a, th in a therapist. Some therapists don't concern themselves with that and they get in trouble. All right, let's go on to another email. All right, this next email is from upper tier patron. She wants to be referred to as the girl from Venus. I convinced my mom to take an attachment style assessment and it turns out that she is fearful avoidant or I use the term dismissive because there's so many different terms for the attachment styles, by the way, that I've just reduced them to what I like. I, I like the following labels, secure, avoidant, preoccupied, and, and um, disorganized. So some people refer to the disorganized attachment as fearful avoidant. Going on with her email. It honestly, so she's saying that her mom has fearful avoidant or disorganized attachment. It honestly explains a lot of the paranoia and negativity I witnessed growing up. Do you think you could talk about how a parent's attachment style might affect the early development of a child? End of email. Well, I would listen to my full deep dive on attachment. I'm guessing you have, and maybe it's worth going into more detail. But briefly, it depends, because disorganized, fearful, avoidant parents vary pretty greatly. Uh, uh, Bob will identify himself as fearful, avoidant, or disorganized. And if he had children, which he doesn't, he, I'm guessing, would raise his kids really well. And another fearful, avoidant, disorganized parent could be one of the most abusive, horrific parents you would have ever met. So it's not like knowing how someone scores on a test would give us much information as to exactly what your mom did as a parent when you were young. But you mentioned two things. You mentioned that she was paranoid and that she was negative a lot growing up. By paranoid, I'm guessing that you mean that she was very suspicious of others, that she would react very strongly when there was any hint of people wronging her in some way. 
and that would affect your upbringing. You also say that she's very negative. I'm guessing this means that she was in a bad mood, that she lacked a uh, ability to soothe herself, that she might have been unaware of her own needs, that she walked around with a chip on her shoulder. Uh, you know, if you're paranoid, you're going to be negative because the world you feel like the world is against you. So you're asking how could these parenting behaviors affect the development of a child? Well, again, it varies because there's so many other factors that we would have to take into account. But people with disorganized, fearful, avoidant attachment style as parents are more likely to develop schemas in children with having to do with there's something wrong with me. You know, as a child in a family with a disorganized, fearful, avoidant parent, you're more likely to develop a schema that something is wrong with you that you don't have any self-worth, that you probably shouldn't express your emotions because something bad will happen if you do, that you should probably be very pleasing to other people or else something bad will happen, and that other people can't be trusted with your emotions, that vulnerability is a bad thing, that you just need to be invisible, and so on. There's a lot of different other schemas that one could develop, but those are just the things off the top of my head. Just a general feeling, because you're two, three, four, five years old, and your mother is paranoid and, and negative often, and uh, you know easily hurt and reactive, scary, and not a, a good person to go to when you're uh, in need of something. Well, you're going to learn that other people from that example experience. You're going to be like other people can't be trusted. I can't go to them for help. I need to watch what they're doing to make sure that I monitor their moods because if I don't, I could get in trouble. I need to not think about myself because that'll just distract me from being other focused. I'm not worth love. I'm not getting love. And the reason for that is I'm just not worth it because something's deeply wrong with me. Those are some of the common things that I've seen, but you know, really any of the personality issues and schemas could develop. You could become narcissistic because you could believe that you're better than your mom and that's your way of protecting yourself at the age of four is to look down on your mom, to see her as pathetic and to elevate yourself in a defensive way. So there's a lot of different possibilities. So I don't know, hope that answers your question. All right, this next email is from upper tier patron Vanessa from California. She writes, I recently heard on one of your videos that you have an undergraduate degree in marketing, and it didn't sound like you were too fond of the profession. Could you expand upon your ideas regarding marketing and whether you think someone in marketing can use the power of persuasion for good purposes? I ask because lately, especially with these tough times that bring out mass anger and despair, I've been considering changing careers from marketing to therapy or another field within psychology. Luckily, the marketing I do is mostly educational to some degree, although I still have hard moral choices to make from time to time. So I believe I can use my extreme interest in the human mind for good in marketing. For example, I oftentimes get to use what I am learning about human behavior to create content, like newsletters, to bring our employees together during tough times and help them feel supported. End of email. Well, it's a great question, upper tier patron, Vanessa from California. So the first thing I'll say is I'm sorry for disparaging marketers in general. That's not fair. I was a marketer. Uh, you can definitely do a lot of good in marketing. For example, you can work for a charity. You can be a marketer for a charity. Or you can do very evil things. Like you could be a marketer for some company that is trying to eliminate uh, sus sustaining uh, power resources, if that makes any sense. So, you know, there's a lot of different range to what a marketer would do. And I don't have a disparaging attitude against marketers. I look fondly back at my job. In, it was mainly in market research is actually what I was doing. Surveying customers, surveying patients at a hospital, surveying people who go to a seminar on this or that and what they thought of it. That was, but you know, my overall goal was to be a part of the marketing department, which was to use those data to try to make more money. 
And the thing is, is I don't blame businesses for doing their job. I don't blame capitalism. It's their job. You know, it's it's the bus- the businesses are designed to make money, uh, for the most part. Not always, but they often are. And it's their job to manipulate customers into buying their product. That's what they do. But it has to be balanced out with other forces. For example, government oversight. For example, when the cigarette industry funded research that denied a link to cancer with cigarettes, it was up to the government to fight back on that because the cigarette industry had so much money that they could really throw their weight around and continue to convince the American public that cigarettes were fine and the government had to step in. So we have to have government oversight and that government has to be governed by morality and ethics and serving the greater good of society, which it isn't always. So the government in and of itself isn't a good thing. It has to be governed by a intelligent, wise discourse. The second thing here though, I think what you're talking about, um, Vanessa, is that it also needs to be, so the business push to make money has to also be balanced out with individual or organizational ethics or even morals like you. You don't have to use your marketing skills to help people feel supported, but you do. So you're trying to do some good. But the thing is, is when I talk about marketers, marketers are the cause of many of our problems. Fox News is one big marketing campaign to make people consume their product, like any news program, MSNBC, CNN, all these quote unquote news organizations, and I put them in extreme quotes because news in, in essence is reporting the facts. And to find a news outlet that just reports the facts is almost impossible, particularly among the popular ones. Because these are marketing organizations, they're not news organizations. They are trying to make money. How do they make money? Selling advertising. How do they sell advertising? Keep people watching. How do you keep people watching? You scare the crap out of them. You make them so afraid that they feel like they have to watch in order to be safe. And how do you make people afraid? Well, all you do is spin and highlight and or flat out lie to people about the other side. Uh, so they're all, all these news organizations are run by marketers, not by news people. There are ethical news creators that want to stick to the facts. There are people who work for Fox News and MSNBC who want to stick to the facts, but the marketers will push them to make it more appealing to the market, meaning more fear mongering, more lying, more spinning. And this is why we have a massive divide in our country. It's not because our political views have changed. It's because we, because ne- back in the old days, we just had the six o'clock news. There weren't two different news organizations. So these news organizations had to market themselves to everyone. Well, now with different cable channels and you know internet echo chambers, it's very easy for marketers to get in touch with their people that will be susceptible to manipulation. And this happens on both sides. So marketers have ruined our country. Everything you, th- you think is terrible about our country regarding politics and the, de- and the continuing divide and the hatred that you personally have of, of the other side of the aisle is 100% due to marketers. It's not due to news people. News people, the you know, good ethical news people, are smarter than that. They want to report on the facts. They want to report on. They want to report on nuance. It's the marketers that ruin everything. The marketers have made all of us terrified of the other side of the aisle. It's made Democrats terrified of Republicans, and it's made Republicans terrified of Democrats. Marketers are to blame. It is a massive problem. And as, a, and as a populace, we have almost no awareness of how marketers are manipulating us on a daily basis. It is rampant and it is marketers' fault. It's not your fault, Vanessa, because <laughs> you probably don't work for a situation like that. 
But that, and that's just one example, okay? Because marketers have created entire mental disorders. Body dysmorphia is something that marketers have created. Anorexia. Now, do these things exist at, you know, in, a, in a vacuum chamber that, you know, would they be around if marketers hadn't been manipulating things? Maybe, but maybe not. Because we see these kinds of disorders cropping up in only certain societies, societies like ours that have massive amounts of body shaming in marketing. They taught, marketers have taught us that only particular body shapes are attractive or worthy. They taught women that body hair was disgusting. They taught us that having an old car makes you low class. They taught mothers to shame themselves for having non-normative children. They taught us that black people have to look a certain way in order to be acceptable to white people. They taught us that dandelions in your lawn were a sign of low class. They taught us that it's okay for boys to be boys, but girls have to be different. They taught us that Asian Americans are foreigners all the time. It drives me effing crazy. They taught us that Pepsi and Kendall Jenner can end racial justice with a flower. And the list goes on and on. They got us to think of ourselves as consumers instead of humans. One of my mentors, uh, Philip Cushman at my university, he uh, wrote a whole book on the development of the self. And he, he talks, and it talks about how in history, the different ways in which society shapes how we see ourselves. And he and many other intelligent, wise thinkers propose very convincingly that our society has created consumers instead of humans. We think of ourselves as consumers. We think of ourselves as our things. I, I'm, I'm the sort of person who drives a Honda car. I'm the sort of person that drives a Mercedes. I'm the sort of person that has a Apple computer. I'm the sort of person that builds my own PC. I'm the sort of person that lives in Seattle and buys these kinds of things. I'm the sort of person that, walks fo that watches Fox News. We're no longer humans that interact with other humans. We are the things that we buy. I'm the sort of person that uses Bing instead of Yahoo, instead of Google. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Mac person, I'm a PC, I'm a Sony camera person, I'm a Nikon person. Uh, you know, the list just goes on and on. That is ridiculous. Now, it's not the end of the world, but we have to reflect on that and think, well, what's going on here? Who, who am I really? Am I just someone to buy things from other things? You know, we, we value our self-worth, we link our self-worth to the stuff that we own. And it, it's there. So it is known within marketing. And I remember learning this, that in order to be a good marketer, you have to create dissatisfaction in others. Just think about that for a second. In order to be a good marketer, you have to create dissatisfaction. And if you can hear something, there's someone mowing the lawn outside. <laughs> Actually, I think it's a blower. Anyway, hope that doesn't. I'm on a rant. I can't stop. I'm not going to wait for that noise to end. It is marketers' job to create dissatisfaction in other people. That's their primary um, directive. That's the prime directive, to use a Star Trek thing. Some are subtle and some aren't so subtle. For example, when the advertisements with Matthew McConaughey driving a Lincoln car, they're attempting to make you feel crappy about yourself because you aren't as cool as him and you're not in, in a cool of a car. And that by buying this completely overpriced car, you will feel better about yourself. But we all know that doesn't work at all. And the list goes on and on and on. Marketers are supposed to make you feel crappy about yourself. When Victoria's Secret shows models in, you know, skimpy clothing, they, that is specifically designed to make you to f feel terrible about yourself and to think, Come into our store, buy our product, and you will feel this. You will feel better about yourself. That doesn't work. Now, I'm not going to say that buying something isn't fun. I buy all sorts of things, and it's fun. But we have that, so it's not like it isn't fun to have a new toy or to have a useful device. Uh, people were yelling at me, not terribly, but I had a crappy webcam for my YouTube videos, and um, I got a new camera. It's actually I just borrowed one of my wife's cameras, and it's fun to have this new camera and to fiddle around with it. So material items, they're not 
they're not absent of enjoyment, but we have to really think about what we're doing. And that thinking is a practice that we have to create in response to marketers manipulating us. When I grew up in the 80s, I remember there was a lot of talk about how advertising was manipulating us. I, I don't remember how much talk, but I remember there was a fair amount. I think a lot of parents were concerned about how many advertisements were being pumped at people in general and kids as well. I feel like today there isn't as much concern about that because we've become so complacent. When I was a kid in the 80s, commercials to kids pretty much only existed on TV, and they only existed you know, two or three times per show. So you'd be watching Looney Tunes, and these commercials would come on, and the parents would see the commercials and be like, whoa, that commercial is very manipulative. Now my kid wants the new toy and this sort of thing. I need to sit down and talk with my kids about advertising. Today, I don't know the stats, but they have researched this. Kids come into contact and humans come into contact with potentially hundreds, if not thousands of ads every day. And we just have become used to it. It's just like, well, yeah, I mean, that's just, you know, when you go to a, a news page or a website or you're driving down the road or you're listening to Spotify or Pandora and a commercial comes on, it's just part of the thing. It's like, okay, there you go. There's a, there's a commercial. And when you listen to this podcast, there are commercials that are inserted. In fact, we're about to go to break and there will be there will be commercials. And it just becomes part of the background. And I feel like, at least in my circle, there's not enough talk about how marketers are screwing with us and ruining our lives, making us feel like we're not good enough, making us feel like our body looks like crap. How many of you out there loathe to look at yourself in the mirror? How many out there... How many people out there think of their bodies as terrible or as suboptimal, as not good enough? How many people out there think your hair isn't good enough or your face isn't good enough or your car isn't good enough or your house isn't good enough? Why is that? Marketers have done that to us. Marketers have dis made us feel dissatisfied. Your house is ugly. Your face is ugly. Your body is ugly. Your life is ugly. You are ugly. And if you buy my product, you will no longer be ugly. That's what marketers have done. And so, Vanessa, when I talk about how I have a feeling about, you know, a negative feeling about marketers, it's that. And when I was a marketer, I kind of felt like I was one of those people. I kind of liked my job, as I said. But I also saw my entire life before me, and I saw a lifetime of essentially manipulating other people. I saw two different things. I saw that I would like the job, but I also saw that I would be manipulating people to do things. I also saw that I'd be pushing papers. That was another thing I remember thinking that my job was mainly. It was just a lot of emails and pushing papers and meetings, and it just it felt like just a lot of business-to-business -business conversations that didn't feel like it was connected to the human race or to the earth in any way. And so, anyway, so... I'm not saying that all marketers are like this. And here's the thing. I'm not saying we have to dismantle cap capitalism. A lot of people, when they hear me talk like this, they think that I am anti-capitalism, like I want communism or something. No. Uh, as Winston Churchill said, democracy, you could replace capitalism in there, uh, is terrible, but it's it's better than the other. I can't remember the exact quote. I'm terrible with quotes and idioms. But the point is, is that capitalism in and of itself doesn't have to be thrown away. We can modify it. We can become wiser with it. Just like a gun, for example, a handgun isn't a terrible thing. We just have to create regulations and training and you know, we're just, there's it, things in of itself can do good or they can do bad. And so capitalism can do good things. There have been examples of capitalism doing wonderful things. Uh, this podcast is a capitalist en endeavor. I'm trying to get people to become patrons. I'm trying to get people to listen to advertisements so that I can make money. And when I make more money on the podcast, it means I can cut back on my hours at the university, cut back on my hours in my private practice and other things that I'm doing to try to pay the bills so that I can create this thing. 
But I, th- in my heart, I think that what I'm doing with this podcast is I'm trying to make a positive difference in the world. So I am using marketing and capitalism to make a positive difference in the world. I don't know if I'm making a positive difference in the world, but this is how I am attempting to do that. And I think about that all the time. I'm not just trying to make money or I'm not just trying to manipulate people. Uh, uh, only I, I am trying to manipulate people to become patrons. But I'm doing so trying to make a positive difference in the world. I'm not trying to buy a Lincoln, for example. I still drive, you know, Honda, what kind of cars? (laughs) Accord. I have a Honda Accord. Strange I wouldn't know that. Well, they call it a Sport, which is sort of a midlife crisis Accord. But it's still an Accord. It's a cheap car. And uh, so I'm not – I have a sensible house. I have have sensible things. So I'm not trying to buy, you know, diamond rings and all this. My point is, is that – in fact, I've been thinking about this lately because the podcast has been making a little bit more money. And I was thinking, and the, the immediate thing that popped in my head is, oh, great, I get to donate more money to charity. I get to have more scholarships for people because I want to make a positive difference in the world. That is the choice that I make. I'm not saying, ooh, I want to buy a yacht because being a, having a yacht would make me feel like an important person. I try to be reflective on that. I don't say, ooh, I'm going to buy more expensive things. It's It's like... Is that really going to make me happier? How much happier would I be if I were to buy a Lincoln, which is overpriced in my opinion, uh, you know, BMWs, these kinds of cars overpriced. How much happier would I be if I bought one of those cars as opposed to giving ten to $2,000 scholarships to people who are trying to make a positive difference in the world? I'm going to say if I, when I give money, because I have given thousands of dollars to uh, students who are trying to make a positive difference in the world, it makes me feel so good about myself, <laughs> not in a narcissistic way, but in an altruistic, compassionate way. It just makes me feel like I am in line with the road of uh, worthiness or goodness or positivity or something. Anyway, so marketers as I am can think about the ethics of what they're doing. So uh, for example, Starbucks recently, I only heard the headline, so God knows I could have all the details wrong, but I saw one headline on one day on Reddit that said that Starbucks was denying their employees wearing Black Lives Matter t-shirts. And then the next day there was a backlash and they said, okay, yes, Starbucks employees can wear Black Lives Matter accoutrement. And this is a this is a, a a business that is you know Starbucks Central, which is probably mostly run by liberal people. By the way, it's in Seattle, the headquarters, and they are probably thinking, well, yeah, we support Black Black, Black Lives Matter, but we have Starbucks all over the country. We have Starbucks in communities where ninety nine percent of the people are Republican or anti-Black Lives Matter or whatever. We have, we have Starbucks that are owned and, uh, and uh, patronized by white supremacists. <laughs> I mean, they probably even have stats on that. They're like, in this town, we know that this town has a lot of white supremacists in it, known KKK members, and we have a Starbucks there, and everyone likes coffee. And so there is a... Um, an interest that for, for them to be like, well, we support Black Lives Matter, but we don't want to alienate our customers and cause uh, people to boycott us. We, you know, we, 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 we've run into situations like that before. Let's just try to stay out of it. Let's not create controversy. And then there's a backlash, and I'm just supposing what's happening in the boardroom. And they're thinking, okay, well, now we're getting a backlash. Well, what do we do? So they have two different markets they're trying to a- a- appease. There's the people who hate Black Lives Matter, and they're like, well, we could either please them or we could, pl- or we could please the people who support Black Lives Matter. Which group do we, do we support? Either way, we're going to lose money, right? And so, or we have the potential to lose money. We have the potential, potential to gain money, but probably in all likelihood, they have potential to lose money. So what are we going to do? Well, I'm guessing, I'm hoping that they said, well, let's think about ourselves as humans first and marketers second. Because humans first say Black Lives Matter. We need to stand up for that. And so the issue here, Vanessa from California, is to think of ourselves as humans first, 
marketer second. Humans first, humans first, and then consumer second. We have to, as my mentor, Phil, Dr. Phil Cushman would talk about, we have to think and talk a lot about these issues because if we don't, they just become part of the background of our personalities. We just become, uh, we just become manipulators as marketers. We just become materialistic. We just become consumers without thinking. We just become the notions that marketers are trying to teach us that buying things will make us happier, that low class is terrible, that high class is special and makes you better and will make you happy. And unless we think and talk and read and push back and you know, make other people aware and make ourselves aware, then we will believe the marketers. You know, think about in the world right now, how many people are trying to manipulate you? Who is trying to manipulate your mind? You have millions of marketers who are trying to manipulate, manipulate your mind. There's probably a few hundred that are very present in your life, a particular brand, a particular political ideology, a particular news channel, a particular social media site. These kinds of, uh, you know, these, this smaller set of marketers to, that are particular to you in, in your pocket are desperately trying and putting millions and billions of dollars into manipulating your mind, okay? And they, they employ psychologists and researchers and market researchers to figure out how to best manipulate you to buy their product and to think the thoughts that they want you to think. Okay, so we have that pressure that is working. What's the counter pressure? What are we doing to push back on that? Is there an equal amount of organizations that are in your life trying to tell yourself to not be a blind consumer to not believe the advertisements, to laugh at pretty much every advertisement that's trying to manipulate you to do something, to laugh at every advertisement that's trying to create dissatisfaction in you, to raise awareness in kids, to raise awareness of what some of these businesses are actually doing in, in the world, whether good or bad. H how, much, how many people are actively manipulating the public and yourself to think critically about advertisements. I'm gonna say zero. I'm gonna say n there's no one in your life that is pushing back. Well, guess what happens? You just become manipulated. You just become one of the people. I'm one of those people. I'm not saying you, I'm saying, I I'm saying me. Me, I become manipulated. <laughs> I've had thoughts that I've had to question and I've bought things and thought, why the hell did I just buy that stupid thing? There are so many things like that. So. Think about that and create a, a practice of pushing back, talking about it. And for the love of God, talk to your kids. Talk to your kids every week, every month. Okay, see that advertisement right there? What do you think that advertisement is trying to make you think? How is that advertisement trying to mess with your mind? Think critically. Okay, that, that banner ad that just came up that shows a woman with uh, yellow teeth and they're trying to sell uh, teeth whitening. What is that ad trying to say to you right now? Well, uh, you know, a lot of people would be like, well, it's trying to give me a solution to yellow teeth because yellow teeth is ugly. No, let's look deeper. The advertisement is trying to tell you that yellow teeth is bad, that yellow teeth is disgusting, and that if you have yellow teeth, you are disgusting. That's another one of those tricks that, that marketers has pushed on us. When I was growing up, no one concerned themselves with yellow teeth. Older people, you know, you drink coffee, you smoke cigarettes, your teeth get a little not so white anymore. I don't remember anybody caring about that in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. But lo and behold, today, you have actors and people who care about this sort of thing with glistening white teeth. They're almost like overly white. You're just like, my God, your teeth, are they fake? Because marketers have taught all of us, they have invented dissatisfaction and invented a marketplace. They have sucked our money. They have gotten into our heads and convinced all of us that yellow teeth are disgusting. 
That is not a human trait. We do not come out of the womb believing that yellow teeth are disgusting. That is a, that is a manipulation of marketers. There were marketers who sat in a boardroom and, and thought, okay, right now, most people don't care about yellow teeth. Most people don't even notice. How do we manipulate everyone into believing that they have to buy our product? Well, we got to make them believe that yellow teeth is disgusting. We got to let them believe that yellow teeth makes them look like low class, like they're poor, like they're unattractive and gross and dirty. They're, you know, yellow teeth means you're dirty. Yellow teeth means nothing. It means you drink coffee. It means you're older. It means you uh, have lived a life. Having bright ass white teeth means you have allowed yourself to become manipulated by the marketers into buying something you never needed and might even harm you. I don't know. Maybe those products aren't good for you. I don't know. Now, some of you out there listening are dentists who actually do these kinds of things. And, you know, whatever. On the scale of things, teeth whitening is not the end of the world. But this is the kind of thing that we have to do. And I think it's because I grew up in the 80s when there were so few advertisements and I had, I guess, enough people telling me that I, I had a friend uh, that I would spend the night at his house and his parents were artists and they were hippies, <laughs> you know, like just classic hippies from the 60s. My parents w were a little older than to be hippies. So when I was at his house and we'd watch TV, when the commercials would come on, the mom would stand up and turn off the television. And this is before remote control. So you had to stand up and just walk over to the TV and turn it off. And I just thought that was the weirdest thing, but I liked it. I thought, huh, that's kind of nice because I'm not, it's a message to the child of advertising is evil because it kind of is, especially to kids, really, when you think about it. So now can advertising be a wonderful thing? Yeah, it can be, but a lot of it is evil. A lot of it, even when you try to push back on it in your mind, like, I'm not going to believe that yellow teeth is a bad thing. And I'm not, I'm not talking about yellow, yellow. I'm talking about like slightly off white teeth. That's what I'm talking about. And, uh, you know, trying to push back on that, it's hard. Anyway, I'm rambling. So that's what I think about marketing. So how do we use marketing for good? All you marketers out there. Be a human first. Be a human. There's nothing wrong with marketing your business. There's nothing wrong with, quote unquote, manipulating the public to buying your product. There is something wrong with making people feel like crap. There is something wrong with, quote unquote, creating dissatisfaction. There is something wrong with pumping ideas into people's heads that makes them paranoid about themselves and feel bad about themselves. That's just, it's immoral to do that. And a lot of marketers know that they're doing that. And that is immoral. It's wrong. Because making money is not the road to happiness. Manipulating people to buy your product is not the road to happiness. So that's what I'll say about that. All right, let's take a break and let's listen to some commercials, ironically. <laughs> if, you're, if you're a patron, which means I manipulated you into becoming a patron, then you don't have to listen to commercials. But if you aren't a patron, then you're going to have to listen to some commercials. And as you're watching them, be very skeptical. So you actually use this time. Whatever commercials come up, think about, okay, what is this commercial trying to do to me? How are they trying to make, how are they trying to make me feel dissatisfied with myself? How are they trying to lower my self-worth? What are they telling us about humans? Even if it's a mild one, like a, like a cleaning product or something. You know, really be critical about that. Use this opportunity. All right, let's listen to some commercials. All right, this next email is from upper tier patron Nelia. She writes, I am a psychotherapist and relatively new to individual private practice. Prior to that, I worked at various community mental health clinics until I got my license. One topic that I have not heard talked about in our community is clients terminating treatment prematurely and how, and how to approach that therapeutically. I know there are many reasons for clients. I, I know there are many reasons why clients may want to terminate treatment. In my experience, I've had clients leave for a couple 
after a couple of sessions, after a few months, or after a year. Some reasons for leaving include not feeling like they were getting something out of therapy, and they just want to discuss their fe- and they just don't want to discuss their feelings the whole sessions. Fe- feeling like they're not getting the advice that they were expecting to fix their problems. And now with times of COVID being frustrated with video sessions, I would be interested in hearing you talk about your experiences with clients terminating treatment prematurely and how it has affected you. I think many therapists don't talk about this because they could be perceived as bad therapists. I tend to analyze the content of our sessions and try to identify what I did wrong. I'm getting regular supervision to help with this and I'm in my own treatment. End of email. Yeah, it's a great question. It's often ignored, as you say, because of shame. And it's good that you're in supervision, good you're in therapy, and it's good that you're trying to identify what went wrong when you feel like a client uh, terminated prematurely. And that's what I do with my supervisees, is I will say, well, let's reflect on maybe what went wrong there. But the first thing I tell therapists is that it's common for clients to terminate, quote unquote, prematurely. I remember learning years ago, and I don't know the exact statistic, but something like the average therapy course is five sessions, something like that, which makes a lot of sense to me. When you think about all the clients who come into all therapists, long-term therapy is not the norm. Short-term therapy is the norm. Now, some clients will become long-term thera- long-term clients, but the vast majority of clients, you know, the bell curve is around five to 10 sessions. That's the average. So you're going to have a lot of clients where they come in, they feel like that's all that they needed. They met their goals within five to 10 sessions. They got everything they felt like they could from that therapist. Or after a while, they just figure it's not a good fit, or it's just bad therapy, or they don't have enough time or money, or They just wanted to try it out for a few sessions, and maybe they'll try again in a while. Uh, Maybe it was a crisis that they just wanted some some help with. So, yeah, there's a the first thing we just have to recognize because because when my supervisees have a client who terminates prematurely, they often feel shameful, like they're inadequate, they did something wrong, and I always just remind them that that's that's normal. That's normal for clients to terminate early. I personally haven't had to deal with that lately because all my clients currently I've been seeing for many years. And the older you get, the further you get in your private practice, the more likely your practice is going to be like that. Because, you know, it, let's say one out of 20 clients is a really good fit with you and wants to keep you around in perpetuity. So you start off with 20 clients. Well, 19 are going to terminate uh, at a you know at a certain point, say after five sessions or 50 sessions. But that one that st- that was a really good fit with you and wants to be in therapy for a long time, then that person's going to stick with you. Well, the next batch of 20 th- clients to come your way, if one of them is a long-term client, then after a little bit, 19 are going to go away and you're left with these two. And you just keep repeating that process. And eventually after 24 years, I've been in practice for 20, 23 years, private practice. And after a while, you just, it just becomes, you don't have, you only have long-term clients. But in the past, I had a variety of clients. I had long-term clients and I had short-term clients. And the thing that I came to personally after a long time was I just became desensitized to it, honestly. I just became like, well, you know, because uh, what happens with a lot of clients is they don't really terminate often. What they do is they will make an appointment and they'll cancel it or they won't show for it or something like that. And they will uh, say, okay, well, you know, I'll call you when I want to reschedule. And then they just, they'll just never call <laughs> because they, they, in the moment, they might be thinking, well, I don't know if I'm ready to terminate, but I don't really feel like I need therapy this week. So, you know, I'll, I'll wait until next week. And, you know, maybe I'll make an appointment in a couple of weeks. And so I'll call them then. And then one thing leads to another. Months pass by and they just never got back to their therapist. A lot of my clients have terminated that way. 
And that's, that's really common. And I, and I'm fine with that. And when that would happen, it, so it would take me a while to realize I'd be like, oh, wait, that person hasn't made a, made an appointment in a few weeks. I wonder if they're terminating. And sometimes I'd reach out to them if I felt like I needed to, if they were suicidal in the past or something like that. But often I'd just consider it a, a soft termination. <laughs> they're just drifting away. Now with some clients, I'll formally terminate them, meaning that I will send them a letter or send them a notification saying that they've been formally closed at, from my file just because you need to do that ethically and to cover your own ass. But but anyway, uh, but in the beginning, it really hurt. I, I, I don't remember specifics, but I remember the, you know, early in my career being an intern and having a client terminate with me saying that, yeah, I don't think you're the right therapist for me or I don't think this is really helping, so I'm going to terminate. It hurts, man, because you're you're working your ass off. You put a lot of effort into trying to become a good therapist, and when a client terminates with you, it hurts. It could hurt particularly in private practice as you're going into practice, uh, Nelia, is that it's your practice, and if you failed a client, then it's completely your fault, whereas when you're at a mental health agency, mental service agency, then it could be blamed on other factors, this kind of thing. Anyway. So, yeah. Now, what I do try to talk, and I would do this when I would have clients terminate, but lately in the past, you know, 10 years, it's been mostly about me with my supervisees, is we always talk about it. We say, okay, well, what could have gone wrong? And there's a lot of things that could go wrong that you can learn from when a client terminates prematurely. Um, Now, before going into this, the other thing is, is that some clients, their issues are such that they don't know what's best for them and they'll terminate early even though they shouldn't and it's against your uh, advice, it's against your recommendation. And so some clients, uh, the fact that a client terminates doesn't necessarily mean that they know what they're doing, if that makes any sense. But some, a lot of times clients will terminate because we failed them in some way. And we don't want to be ashamed of that, we want to learn from that. And the typical problems are and maybe the most common one is a lack of working alliance, a lack of therapeutic alliance. Research shows that when you have a good alliance with your client, then outcomes are better and, and clients tend not to terminate prematurely as often on average. An alliance is comprised of three elements, a bond, meaning your attachment, goodwill, um, positive regard between client and therapist, and goals, you agree on goals, you agree why the person is in therapy, what you're trying to achieve in therapy, and you agree on the tasks to meet those goals. Without, if you don't have one of those three, then clients will feel off kilter, therapists will feel off kilter, and clients are more likely to terminate. This is extremely important, and a lot of therapists are not trained to have this conversation. A lot of therapists don't even know about the working alliance. They don't even they, they've never heard of it before. They barely understand it. They might they might just think of it as like, oh yeah, you're you're an ally with your client. No, a working alliance means that you have had explicit conversations about what therapy is for, why that client is there, what are they trying to achieve. Now, it could be very concrete, as I always say, something like, I want to not be as depressed, I want to lower my depressive symptoms, or it could be something very amorphous, like I just want to improve my relationships or improve my self-esteem. But it is a goal. Now, you don't necessarily have to have numerical markers for that, but, but a general sense, like, okay, a client asks you, well, how will I know when my relationships are improving? Well, you'll feel better in them, they'll last longer, there'll be less conflict, that kind of thing. And then tasks to meet that goal. That's the third element of the working alliance. Do you, as a therapist and your client, agree on how you're going to meet those goals? The client is coming in to talk about their marriage. Well, what's the goal? Is the goal to uh, complain? So, So this is something that happens a lot is someone comes in and they're sad, depressed, they're grieving, and they're ups- let's just say they're upset, and they really want to talk about their marriage. It's a frequent thing that clients want to talk about. And they've been married for 10 years, and there's a lot of conflict, and they don't know what to do. And so the, the client sits down, 
and they start talking about the conflict. And you as a therapist listen and you validate and you listen and you validate and you might throw out a few ideas here and there. And then the session ends and the client goes home. But never was there a conversation about, well, what by talking about your spouse and by me validating you, is this what you want to be doing in therapy? Is this the goal of therapy? What, what are we doing here exactly? What are you trying to achieve? When you, when you sit down on my couch and you start complaining about your husband, what are you hoping to get out of today's session? Because I want to make sure that I do what you want to get out of today's session. Well, some clients might uh, really benefit from that conversation because they might not, they might be thinking you're the one that's supposed to be coming up with that, but that isn't the case. Clients come up with goals of therapy. So the client might think, okay, well, my therapist seemingly really just wants me to complain about my husband, so that's what I'm going to keep doing. And eventually this therapist is going to reveal to me why they are encouraging me to complain about my husband. And so as a therapist, you might be saying, wow, this client really wants to complain about their husband. I'm going to validate them. But unless you have an explicit conversation of like, okay, what are we doing here? Then the, you might not be on the same page and the client will terminate when they realize that there is no, there is no end result of that process that is concrete. And then, so, so let's say they start complaining about their husband and then at some point, so you're validating at some point you say, well, okay, so I just wanna check in with what you wanna get out of today's session and maybe all of our sessions in general. You seem to really wanna talk about your husband. What are you hoping to get out of that? So that's a wonderful conversation because just complaining and getting validation, although helpful, isn't really the purpose of therapy, right? We're, what are we trying to get? Now, maybe it's something grander than their relationship with their husband. Maybe it's their attachment insecurity that you can get at, that it's not just their relationship with their husband that they're trying to get some clarification around. It's the client's attachment insecurity that they're enacting with the therapist, if that makes any sense. And then you have to talk about tasks. Okay, so you want to work on your attachment and security. You want to work on your relationship with your husband. Well, he here is what I can offer you in terms of therapeutic uh, actions. We can talk about your husband. You can tell me what's going on. And then I can give you insight into maybe where your husband's coming from. Would that help you? Or I can... We, we can try to get to the bottom of your emotions and your attachment insecurity triggers so that you can have better awareness of your attachment insecurities and triggers and so that, and then you can communicate those attachment reactions to your husband to better your relationship. Would that help you, client? You have to have very explicit conversations because otherwise clients will sit down in your couch and they don't know that they're supposed to, they don't know about the working alliance, you do. And so they don't know necessarily to say, so I want to talk about goals and I want to talk about tasks, tasks. And you know what? I don't feel like I'm very bonded with you. I don't feel like you really care about me that much. They don't know that. You as a therapist are supposed to do that. Why? Because research proves that that is a critical feature in the outcomes of therapy, regardless of what therapeutic orientation you come from. You're a CBT therapist. Your alliance, the relationship is more important than your adherence to CBT. If you're a psychodynamic therapist, it's the same thing. So what I will often talk about, and I will often find to be true when I talk to my supervisees, is that the alliance was off. Now, maybe the alliance was off, not because of the therapist. Maybe the therapist really put a lot of effort into building that alliance, and the client resisted for one reason or another. That was, you know, un, uh, sort of adjustable for the, for the therapist. But often what it is, is the therapist is having some countertransference around inadequacy or some issue, and it's clouding them to their job, their professionalism around building an alliance, talking about goals, talking about tasks, bonding with the client. And this can lead to not really listening or therapists being too afraid to be human with their clients. They're, they're trying to be quote unquote professional and not human enough so that there's not a, a bond, there's not a deep enough connection between the therapist and the client. Clients will terminate often when that happens or uh, not conceptualizing well. A lot of therapists, so going to school to become a therapist, 
whether it's a doctorate or a master's, is not enough time to develop what you need to develop in terms of conceptualization skills. I've never met a post-grad therapist who could conceptualize a client well. They all need tremendous amount of work on that. When I graduated, I couldn't conceptualize clients well. It took me years to develop that skill. So after you graduate, you need to continue to develop your conceptualization skills. Conceptualization skills are complicated. You're essentially trying to hold 100, 1,000 points of data in your head and weighing all of them as various factors contributing to the problem at hand. Even just defining what the problem at hand is, I find to be hard for a lot of therapists. So just because you're practicing and just because you're licensed and just because you've, you're post-grad doesn't mean you actually know what you're doing. 99% of what I've learned as a therapist happened well after I went to graduate school. So conceptualizing is a, is a very, very important thing. It's hard to think in a advanced way as a conceptualizer. And I will tell you that I probably wasn't good at conceptualizing until five years ago, which would have been 17 years into my career. So it takes a long time. Now, how do you adjust for that when you suck at it as a novice? You have good supervisors who can do that for you. You have good consultants who can do that for you. That's the importance of our field, supervision, consultation. I have, I have people who hire me for consultation who have been practicing for 15, 20 years because they understand that, one, it, it just improves their ability to be a therapist if they talk about their cases with someone, regardless of how along you are in your career. And two, we all have things to learn. So, uh, so there's that. Also, another reason why people cl clients will terminate prematurely is there's not enough compassion or that the therapist isn't questioning their own cultural norms. You know, I hear things from therapists sometimes. They'll say something like, yeah, I have this new client, and boy, I just kind of feel like he's a douchebag because he's dating a lot of women at the same time. Or, you know, that's just an example. I haven't heard that specifically, but that's an example. Things like that. I will hear therapists say things that are obviously culturally, um, they're cultural interpretations. And instead of being able to step outside of your cultural notions and seeing the client for who they are, instead of interpreting them through your own cultural lens, because in your cultural pocket, it might be weird for someone to date a lot of people at the same time. And for that person, maybe it's, it's totally normal for everyone to date a lot of people, polyamory circles, for example. Anyway, the point is, is that not questioning your cultural notions is something that is very hard for anyone to do, therapists included. And unless you spend a lot of time analyzing the propaganda that you have absorbed, you know, a lot of people, when, the, when you talk about cultural bias, they'll be like, oh, racism against black people. Like, oh, this is just kind of a side note. On the first day of graduate school, I teach a class that's, that's the first quarter. And I will always ask people about the culture that they come from. I'll say, you know, give me, give me some background about your culture. And since uh, mental health is dominated by white people, uh, which is a problem that we're always trying to change, but um, it's mostly white students, mostly white women students in, in my program, that they will almost always... So I'm just asking them an open-ended question. I'm just saying... Um, tell me something about the, your childhood culture. I'll just say, you know, tell me something about your childhood culture. And to, be, to, to skip ahead, what I'll say is that childhood culture is a billion different things. Like for me, I grew up in the borderlands between suburbia and rural, out, the outskirts of Seattle. So I have some rural uh, notions growing up, and I have definite suburban notions growing up. I grew up in a primarily white community, almost like 99.9% .9 white people in my community. I grew up as a boy, and I had a lot of gender notions being taught to me. I grew up in the Seattle area and in the United States watching cartoons, and, and so there's a lot of American culture in me. 
I grew up in the 70s, and there's kind of a 70s culture. I grew up in a church, a Christian church that was filled with a lot of baby boomers who were kind of hippie-ish, and so I have a lot of hippie Christianity in my bones and so on. So that's my culture. That's the culture I come from. And I could go on and on about the fact that I'm half Japanese and half European American, half Japanese American, half European American, that um, I, you know, there's just sports culture. So there's just so many different things I could talk about. But when I ask therapists on the first day of school to tell me about their childhood culture, half of the white people will say, well, I grew up without any culture. We didn't have a culture. And uh, and also, my dad was racist against black people. I'm being kind of facetious a little bit, but that's kind of the, the vibe or the statements that I'll get from a lot of white people is I grew up in an area that didn't have any culture and my uncle was racist against black people and I didn't like that. And that is just, and in the program, we try to rid these people of their unsophistication regarding their reflection on their own culture. But a lot of, it's really hard to know what culture you're in because you're swimming in it. It's hard, like like the notion about whether or not to use corporal punishment with children is a hugely cultural idea. And I find that a lot of people in my field will just say, well, corpor- corporal punishment is wrong. And when you actually look at the data around the world, it's it's nuanced. You can use corporal punishment, meaning you know spanking of a certain degree, in a way that can be very loving and very caring and very helpful to the development of a child. But you try to say that notion to a group of white women therapists, and you're going to get a lot of scoffing. Um, I I was on YouTube Live a couple weeks ago, and someone asked me that question, you know, what's your stance on corporal punishment? And I went on a long, uh, just not a long, but a semi-long discussion of the research. Now, I will say in my corporal or in my uh, cultural pocket, I don't adhere to using corporal punishment and I don't use corporal punishment. And in my family, it was barely ever used. There were spankings in my, when I was growing up was really to prove a message. And it never hurt. It was never like a physical thing. It was more just like, oh my God, my my mom or my dad are, is just really upset. And post like age four, we were never spanked, that kind of thing. So I'm not a proponent of corporal punishment, but I'm a proponent of not being a cultural colonizer with your own ideas. It's a very tempting thing for white people who believe that corporal punishment is wrong to 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 just say, well, it's wrong for everyone. And parenting is more complicated than that. So there's a lot of things like that. There's a lot of little cultural assumptions that people make that uh, will interfere with your relationship with your clients and will push them away. And then they don't wanna come back. And lo and behold, there's a certain class of people, groups of people who actually don't go to therapy because they uh, have had bad experiences. So if you come from a cor- culture where corporal punishment is the norm and acceptable and you're told by your white therapist that it's wrong uh, empirically, then – and it doesn't really fit and you just feel like, oh, I feel like you're just being a white person in this, mo- in this notion. And I'm, I'm pointing out white people, but it's, it could be anyone. You could have a black therapist who has a cultural bias to their own bias, their own cultural notions and – have a hard time opening themselves up. So it has nothing to do, now white people traditionally have a harder time because in the United States because it's a dominant culture and so it's harder to see culture. That's one of the benefits of me growing up as a Japanese American person was that I would hear these notions about Japanese people or Asian Americans and I would say, oh, that's wrong because I know that's wrong. You know, the way that dominant mainstream America is talking about Asian Americans, I know that that's wrong. I wonder what else is wrong. And so it really made me question everything I was being told by culture from a very early age. Now, I'm not a master at it by any stretch. No one can be a master at it. It's too difficult. It's too complex. But I feel like it's easier for me on some level. And it and research has shown that uh, for people who have to code switch and this kind of thing, people who 
don't fit into the mainstream culture, it's easier for them to imagine. It's easier for women to imagine too, right? Because as a woman, you grow up going like, wow, that, that movie portrays women pretty badly. What else am I you know, being told that about other groups of people that's unfair? The people who have the worst time with understanding the mainstream culture and how it dominates things, of course, is you know straight white males. Uh, doesn't mean they can't uh, stretch their brains, but it means that it's harder for them, and we all know that. Anyway, so when so there's so there's various different reasons that I've seen that therapists various different um, failings that they will commit that will result in a client not feeling like therapy is useful or not feeling like there's a connection or not feeling like there's an alliance, and then they will terminate. And all those things are worth reflecting on when you terminate with a client without shame. You just, you know, that's people come, my supervisees, they'll say, oh, I had a client terminate prematurely the other day. And the first thing I say is it happens. It, I know you to be a good therapist, so I'm sure that you gave it your best shot. But let's look at what happened in this relationship to see what we can learn so that the next time someone like this comes along, you can serve them better. Maybe there's something we can learn. Maybe there isn't. And then we enter into conversation about it and we analyze it. I ask them, okay, what went wrong? How was your compassion? Was there a cultural norm that you were imposing on the other person? How, what was your conceptualization? How was the bond? How was the con collaborative goals? How was the collaborative tasks? A lot of times there'll be some holes in there and they'll be like, yeah, I didn't really feel like I had an alliance. Okay, so how could you have built an alliance? What got in the way of you building an alliance with that person? Anyway. That is the end of this episode. Well, what do you think? What do you think about my rant about marketing? Uh, let me know because I don't think I've ever ranted as long as I did about that in that way. <laughs> and everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.